thanks for the intro there. Um, yeah, today, I know it says my name on the program, but we're actually going to do some SMP here and some fair scheduling. That's the last Linux joke I'm going to give. Um, OK, so the E4 meter, it's basically a learning project, right? We're students at UNSW. Um, we're doing power management research. So we thought, why not build our own power meter to do this research? Um, I'm going to give some motivation for why we want to do this, and then give you some overall details about the hardware, because that was a big part of this. And some might say it's split into two parts, hardware and software. Um, and then Bernard's going to go into some details about the software side of it. So let's dive straight in. We, we all know that um, we use a lot of power, right? In Australia, 80% of our electricity is generated from burning coal. These are six power stations in New South Wales. There's two more. And there's plenty more around the rest of the country. In New South Wales, which is where we're from, sorry, Queensland, um, it takes um, about 9.7 million tonnes of coal to generate the electricity needs of just households. And that equates to about 7.3 megawatt hours per person, per household, sorry. So I know that most of um, the coal that Australia has gets shipped off to China where it gets burnt, and we don't have to worry about what happens to the coal that goes there, right? But in Australia, um, we burn 80% of, we, we generate 80% of our electricity from coal. And it's, it's important that people understand how this affects the environment. This is the only melodramatic slide today. Next, it's just fun stuff. So what can we do about this um, problem of ever-growing power consumption? I, I believe that the first step is to raise people's awareness of their own power consumption, to get people to understand how much stuff actually uses. And there are ways that this can be done. For example, you've probably heard of the smart grid. It's a kind of set of buzzwords that are going around these days. Essentially, your power meter on the side of your house sends information back to the distributor, and then that information can then get forwarded off to tools like Google Power Meter, and then you can see how much power you're actually using on a more than quarterly basis, which is when you get your power bills, whatever. So tools like this help. What else can we do? Provide incentives to use renewable energy sources, and governments are already doing this uh, by offering subsidies to install photovoltaic cells on your roof, and you can give back to the grid and make some money even by installing these on your roof. What else can we do? We can give people um, useful tools to manage their own power consumption. And this was one of the motivating factors of the E4 meter, not the primary motivating factor, but a motivating factor. So you might be asking the question, you can, you can already do this. What's special about the E4 meter? These are just a couple of examples of what you can already get out there. Um, they're about 200 bucks if you want to install them in your house. They have this nice little LCD display that you put in your kitchen, and you install something in your power board on the side of the house, which measures the total power consumption um, used by whatever's being powered in your house. And they're designed to be easy to install. You don't have to cut any wires or anything. So you can mostly do the installation yourself. And they're about 200 bucks, as like I said. What about in the data center? We all know that data centers are consuming a growing proportion of power these days. Um, I can't remember any numbers from Google, but it's huge. These, this sort of thing has lots of outlets, so you can stick it on the side of a rack in a data center and individually switch each server on and off in order to sort of manage the load. If you've got high load, switch more on. If you've got low load, switch stuff off. Um, it provides aggregate metering, so it measures the power consumption of the entire rack, um, which has limited use. And it costs about 600 bucks for one of these things. So bringing back to what we're doing, who are we? We're, we're the power management research group at Erthos uh, within NICTA. Essentially, what we're trying to do is we're trying to measure the power consumption of computers, big and small, so from servers to laptops, desktops, and phones, and bed systems, that sort of stuff, in order to determine the effectiveness of power management techniques that are available on these platforms. Um, such as dynamic voltage and frequency scaling, which is used um, by Linux in the on-demand CPU freak governor. 
How are we doing this? We're using this off-the-shelf device. I guess it's not really off-the-shelf. We had to go to a lot of effort to get this one. Um, it's about 700 bucks US, and it measures one device at relatively high accuracy compared to the sort of plug-in devices that you can get off eBay. And it provides computer logging. That's a serial port there, which is a requirement for research, a research power meter. Um, so what does the... What does it mean to determine the effectiveness of DVFS? I'm just going to go into a little bit, one slide about the research, nothing more. So here I'm showing two lines. The blue line, purple line, is the runtime of a benchmark on a particular platform. Um, it's a spec CPU 2000 benchmark. On the bottom, we've got frequency of the CPU. It comes down from 2.4 to 1 gigahertz. And on the right, we've got some normalized value, which is um, green is energy and purple is runtime. It's normalized to the maximum frequency at that end. So you've got one there. And as you reduce the frequency, the runtime generally goes up. As you would expect, you slow down the CPU, stuff takes longer. There's a bit of bump there, but I won't go into the details about why that exists. As you can see, the energy actually comes down below one. So we can reduce the CPU's frequency and save some energy for this particular workload on this particular platform. Um, so there's that trade-off that you've probably all heard of. It's called race to halt. You either run fast and then put the CPU in a deep sleep mode, or you run slower and spend less time asleep. So that's the sort of research that we're doing and why we need to measure the power consumption of these computers that we've got. Moving on. So why build our own power meter? We want to measure more devices at once. Um, we've got multiple people working on this stuff. Having a single power meter is sort of a bottleneck. Um, we want to measure more. We want to spend less. $700 for each meter is a bit too much to spend. And we want to maintain high accuracy because we need to know with, high, with relative accuracy how much power these computer systems are using. Right, a little bit of technical detail about why it's difficult to measure AC power versus DC power because we're measuring total system power consumption. What I'm showing here is a graph of voltage and current for an AC waveform. And usually with a DC meter, you can just multiply voltage and current and you get power. With AC, it's a bit tricky because not everything is nice and resistive like a light bulb, in which case the voltage and the current are in phase. So you may have heard the difference between true power and um, apparent power. There's this phase difference, which we can show by doing this shift. Um, there's an angle there which you need to multiply to get the actual apparent, the, the true power that's being, actually, that's being consumed by the device. And that's actually quite difficult to do um, if you're designing the hardware yourself. And so we ended up with this power meter. This, this is the prototype. Um, with four, device, four individual outlets on the front, so you can measure four devices at once. A little LCD there to show people um, immediate feedback about the power that certain things are consuming. Um, there's also this little device here, which is a sensor array. I'll go into a bit more detail about that in a second. So you can measure and control four devices, um, either with the hardware switches on the front there, or you can use the web interface, which we'll talk a bit more about later. Third motivation for this is this competition that we entered. So this company called Lantronics is running this competition for around their little hardware device called the Export Pro. It's a thumb-sized device. It has 150 megahertz processor inside there, an Ethernet port on one side, and a serial interface on the other side. And it runs Linux, and you can do anything you want with it. It's the world is your oyster with this little thing. We actually won that competition, but I'm not going to ask you to clap or anything. <laughs> so, no, no, no. That wasn't, the, that wasn't the cue. High level overview. Moving on. Appliances on the left, light bulb, computer, whatever. A chip, Turdian, is a company that no longer exists by that name. Um, Bernard's going to go into a bit more detail about the chip. We've got the switches and LCD. They're connected to this microcontroller with an I2C bus. We've got the sensors I talked about. Again, connected with I2C. And the Export Pro with a serial link to the microcontroller so it can read the power measurement readings. And, of course, the network so we can 
get the results off the machine itself. Um, moving on. Okay, so we're young. We don't want to kill ourselves. Um, we're designing all of this high voltage hardware ourselves. Um, we need to isolate the high voltage from the low voltage some way. If we're probing a multimeter in there, we want to make sure that we're not going to accidentally touch something that's going to zap us. So we use this concept of isolation. And to get isolation, you use transformers. The first one is a current transformer. This is essentially the same thing that you install in the power board outside your house if you're installing one of those devices that measures power consumption, as I showed before. The cable that's carrying the power to your appliance runs through the middle of this current transformer. And the changing current in that wire induces a voltage in the coil inside the transformer. We have a little sense resistor over that coil and we can measure the voltage that gets um, induced across the coil with an analog to digital converter in the power measurement chip. The um, accuracy and range of the measurements we can take is determined by the size of that resistor and the number of turns in the coil there. So if we want high accuracy for a, um, a small device, we need to um, think about what value we use for that resistor. Um, obviously, we could have gone nuts and done some magic auto-ranging thing, but that's complexity that we didn't want to introduce at this point. The next device is, an, is a standard relay. just allows us to turn devices on and off. And the last one is this transformer here, which allows us to measure the voltage separately to the current in an isolated way. So I talked about that phase difference between current and voltage before. Measuring the voltage and the current at the same time is necessary, um, so we can take into account that phase difference. Right. Um, we, we didn't use open source tools to design the PCB for similar reasons that B. Dale described before. Um, Basically, there's nothing out there that's free. So we use this tool called Altium, which we're familiar with, and we didn't um, want to expend the time to, to learn the other tools, unfortunately. So this is just a couple of pictures of the PCB design that we came up with to solve the problem. I'm going to hand over to Bernard now, who's going to go into some of the software that we used on the device. Thank you. you want mine? Right. Okay. Um, so I was fairly heavily involved with the software side of things. Um, as Etienne mentioned, measuring AC power is not a trivial exercise. You need to sample both current and voltage at high frequencies and multiply the product to get the true power and so on and so forth. And we looked at doing this ourselves and it turned out that around this time last year when we were designing this, there was a company called Tridian who were formerly in the UK, now Maxim, but who knows? Um, Okay, um, and they make a little nice measurement chip. It's a chip that measures uh, eight ch current channels, it measures voltage, it does all the integration for you, and it spits out an And for our purposes, that was, for our purposes, that was largely what we wanted. Um, is this microphone going crazy? Okay. Um, <laughs> excuse me. Okay, um, so we discovered this chip, and to us it seemed like a perfect panacea. It did everything we wanted, it did it um, without, with very little effort. Uh, it's based around an 8052, which is a little programmable microcontroller. So we, th so we thought, great, we can just do whatever we want with this. Whacked it on the board, designed the hardware, got it fabbed, and went to program it. And it was this point we went to the manufacturer saying, how do you actually program this? And they said, oh, here's this nice binary blob um, that you use to measure the current and take measurement readings. And it didn't seem like such big problems, like, okay, binary is not nice, but we can deal with it. All we want to do is call in and get a current reading, saying that this device is consuming 1.21 gigawatts of power. Um, that's all we wanted, so it didn't seem like such a problem. But unfortunately, in the embedded world, the, the 8052 has been around since 1980. 31 years this year. Um, there's a lot of variety out there, 
And in particular, there isn't much standardization. And so the binary blob that we got given was compiled with um, a specific toolchain, which was kills. Um, ah, kills um, 8051 compiler. Um, if you want to link anything with their binary, you also need kills 8051 compiler. And they wanted to charge us about $1,000 a seat, which was as much as we spent on the entire project. So we weren't really willing to pay that much money. Um, so confronted with the binary blob that we can't do anything with, we went back to the manufacturer and said, well, can you give us the source code? And they said, hell no. Um, so what do you do when you're confront confronted with the binary blob? You, we use Debian systems, so you go apt cache search 8051 disassembler, and sure enough, you install a disassembler for 8051. Um, it took about a month to pour over the disassembly and figure out all the relevant bits that we cared about. Um, being an 8-bit microprocessor, 8-bit arithmetic is really, really straightforward and very easy to decipher. 16-bit um, arithmetic gets a little bit hairy. 32-bit arithmetic, again, suddenly you're looking at 15 instructions just to add two numbers together. Uh, floating point arithmetic, hell, is just daunting to decipher what on earth is going on. Fortunately, Kill document their floating point um, binary formats quite well, so we can figure out what's the exponent, what's the antisir, and see what's going on. Um, and yeah, it, it's a bit daunting, because you get screens like this, which are, I don't know, 15, 20 lines long, trying to figure out what that does. It turns out that negates a number. It says x equals minus x. <laughs> um, but after a while, you get used to it, and you just start seeing patterns, and you figure out what's going on. And so it took us about a month to just reverse engineer everything that we cared about uh, from the power meter. And we wrote it back up in C code and compiled it with one of the open source tools, SDCC. SDCC, you may have heard of, it's an open source compiler for a whole range of little devices, including the 8052. Um, and so now we had an entirely open source code base to work with. Or at least we thought we did. Um, digging further to actually get this chip to do anything useful, um, there's another uh, little microprocessor on it, some kind of DSP. The architecture we have no idea about. Um, it also has a little binary blob that runs on the DSP. And um, we just pulled out the binary blob, put it in our C code, and it seemed to work. But we had no insight into what was going on. Um, so when it turns out that we were getting inaccurate measurements um, for some classes of devices, we had no way to actually dig in and figure out what on earth was going on. Um, so, lesson, take home lesson from this is if you're designing hardware and you're putting chips on that require software, it will save so much time if you can force the manufacturer to give you all the source code. Um, it would have saved us a lot of time. And like, we found bugs in the manufacturer's uh, binaries where they were casting numbers between things and losing precision. And um, Yeah. It would be nice if we could have had the source code. Um, so that was the power measurement chip. Next interesting thing on this device was the Lantronix Export Pro. Um, as Eddie mentioned, it's essentially an Ethernet serial converter about the size of your thumb. And it's got a 68K processor, cold fire on there, um, running at about, the 20, about 20 times faster than a Mac Plus, if anyone owned one of those. So we've, we've come a long way. Uh, it runs at, 150 meg, I think the Mac Plus was 8 megahertz or something. Um, one of the nice things about this is it runs Linux. Uh, it runs UC Linux, uh, which you're given all the source code to, you're given all the um, components, and you can build it yourself. Um, and so on top of this, we developed our little application-specific program. Uh, we like to call it the Power Demon. Uh, what it's responsible for is just talking to the power measurement chip and getting um, energy measurements, uh, to interfacing with the switches in the real world, and also talking to the web server. All pretty standard, boring stuff. Uh, the web server is BOA, which some of you may have heard of. It's um, a very lightweight server. It's very fast for static content. It doesn't handle dy dynamic content, but uh, it will happily fork out to a CGI script for you. Um, if you wanted to be a bit more lightweight in the embedded world, you could hack up, in Bo uh, hack up BOA to do stuff in it, but 
it's a little dirty because if BOA ever released another version, which they haven't done in four and a half years, but if they ever released another version, you'd have maintenance nightmares. Um, so the usual setup goes that um, this is the software components on the system. For static content, um, web request comes in, web server says, I know that file, web request goes out. It's fairly straightforward. Um, dynamic content, slightly more interesting, you have the CGI handler. Request comes in, CGI handler gets past the request. Now, in a normal system, like an enterprise PHP application or um, some other system running on a real machine with gobs of memory, uh, the CGI handler would normally talk to a database, construct an SQL query, say, tell me what's happening with the power. And database goes away and thinks about it, comes back with an answer, that goes to the CGI handler that renders it, gives it to the web server, which gives it to the user. It's a lot of passing around just for very little data. And being an embedded system, like we can't even fit my school on it. There's no way that we're actually going to be able to run a database. So plan A was to have the power daemon have its own little database, and the CGI handler would query power daemon saying, give me the information, kind of like a database. And this worked, but it was very fragile in that every time you wanted to update uh, the format of the data, you need to change two pieces and stuff can break. And you're doing all this code to, because the power daemon and the handler talk over a socket, so you have to serialize all your data. And there's a lot of code that goes into just serializing it and unserializing it and doing very boring things. And it's very fragile. And it actually turned out to be quite a performance bottleneck. Um, so we turned to a plan B. What plan B was is to use a, um, a little known, well, probably known to most people in this room, a feature of the Linux kernel called SCM writes, where you can pass a file descriptor from one process to another. And so the CGI handler could just simply pass the file descriptor that it got from the web server, along with the request that it received, pass it to the power daemon, and at this point, the CGI handler can just exit and leave the room. Um, it doesn't need to know anything about what it, protocol it's speaking. It can just leave all of that generically to the power daemon. Um, so it passes the request, power daemon, um, does whatever it needs to with the request. It doesn't need to interpret data except from uh, the web client. And then just passes it back to the web server and out again. And by removing the marshalling and just passing the file scriptor across, we managed to halve the size of the code base. Maybe we were doing it really badly, I don't know, but it, it made a decent impact. Um, right. okay. So, we hit a couple of issues with the Export Pro. Um, as I mentioned, it doesn't actually have an MMU. So there's no such thing as a seg fault. And if you've ever written C code on a real machine, this is one of the first things you hit when you use Scanf. Um, so any bug on this machine will effectively just kill your entire system. Well, potentially kill your entire system. You're, you're lucky if it does kill it. If it doesn't kill it, then it's just a time bomb waiting to happen. Um, so that's a little unfortunate. But fortunately for us, this is embedded Linux, uh, which is effectively a subset of um, desktop Linux. So the same code that we wrote for this, we can just run on a desktop machine, um, use our tools like Valgrind and GDB and profiling tools to do all the nice things we'd like to do on a real system, and then just take it straight back again. And this resolved most of our hurdles. Um, we still had a couple of hurdles where the system would mysteriously crash. Uh, it would mysteriously crash without our binary, so we don't think it was our source code. Um, this was a little tr tricky to debug. We thought maybe it's the kernel, maybe it's power, um, maybe there's glitching on the power lines. This is something that we spent a, little, a fair bit of time trying to track down, but haven't actually resolved yet. Um, yeah, so end result is you have a little pretty web interface that just get served up. Uh, the web interface allows you to do everything you'd kind of expect to do. Um, turn things on and off remotely. Uh, watch your power consumption go up. Um, configuration, which I'll talk a bit more about in a sec. Um, I'm not trying to spruik anyone in this talk, by the way. No one has paid us for any of the things I'm mentioning. Um, the web interface was done with Google's Web Toolkit. 
don't know if anyone's used it before, but the idea is that you code your web interface in Java. Um, apologies if that offends anyone. Um, you write your entire web interface in Java like it's a Java program, and it compiles the Java to HTML, JavaScript, and CSS, and the entire application runs on the browser. So once you've served it up, the web server doesn't need to do anything else with the application, unless you actually want to do something useful, like talk to the device. Um, so this was actually really helpful for us because it meant that we could take all the processing off the device and keep it on the web or as much as possible on the web server. One of the nice things about Google Web Toolkit is that it comes with all sorts of very pretty visualizations. Um, line charts, gauges, bar charts of US dollars, if that's how you want to represent the currency. Um, all very nice, and, and these are trivial to use. You just say, here's my data, please go plot it. And yeah, trivial. If there's anyone from Google in the audience right now, um, can you wake up for a sec? One of the problems that we hit with um, the visualization stuff is that you need, to, it's not entirely free and open source. Um, you need to actually, the, the, the practical problem is you need to be online to use it. We discovered this the hard way when we were trying to do a live demo without internet access and it didn't work. Um, for some reason, the visualization stuff wants to download a jar file from www.google.com and that's unfortunate. So we thought, okay, we'll just fix that and mirror it ourselves locally. Open up the source code and you find a URL that says, you may not modify this to obtain files off your own server. You must get files from www.google.com. Just a little annoying. Um, so yes, if anyone from Google is in the audience and has cloud over this, it would be really, really good if you could use the visualization stuff offline somehow. Um, yeah, it's open source, but not open source, if you get what I mean. Um, So, end result, pretty black box. Um, there's no interface on that. What you do get is a web interface, which looks like that. And um, one of the issues that we, um, uh, not yet, not yet, <laughs> premature. Uh, one of the issues that we were considering when we designed this was, well, we're building it for research to do our own thing, but given we're doing our own meter anyway, why not throw on some sensors? Like every, everyone's into automation these days. If you had, um, Bedale was uh, automating his greenhouse. Uh, Vince Cerf was automating his wine cellar. Everyone's into automation. And all you need to do is throw on a couple of sensors, and sensors are really cheap. So that's what we did. We threw on some sensors, which faces us with a small problem. Like once you have sensors and you have all this ability to control stuff, you have the question of, now that you can control all this stuff with all this information, how do you make it easy and intuitive for simple people or people that just want to do simple things, but not uh, limit what you can do with the device? And this, like, because there, there's all sorts of amazing things you can do with sensors. You can say, um, the classic, one of the classic examples is your home hi-fi system. You might have eight or nine devices, and each of them consumes a few watts in standby. And eight or nine times a few watts is 80 or 90 watts. Um, and that's a lot of power just for standby. So one of the classic use mod case models is you can buy these power boards which have one outlet which is monitored, and when current starts flowing significantly from that outlet, everything else comes on. So you can turn on your TV, and everything else powers up. Um, th there's all these fancy scenarios that you can dream up to do stuff like this. And without having to code all the interesting scenarios we could think of, we still wanted to let people do those kind of things. So how do you make easy things easy and not limit people? And the answer we came up with was often considered a dirty word. You allow arbitrary code execution. You just let people run their own code on the device. Um, it's not as dirty as you think it is. Uh, the way we ended up doing it was to use a scripting language called Lua. Um, Lua is very lightweight. It's very portable C code. And you can download it and embed it into anything. Uh, it's I think it's under an MIT license, it's quite liberal. Um, and it took us about 20 minutes to download it, compile it, link it in, and start controlling stuff via Lua, which is really, really awesome. Um, it's fast. The only um, backup I have for the claim that it's fast is the website that says, we are faster than most scripting languages. Um, yeah, and it's, and it's very easy to customize. 
which is exactly what we did. So on the web interface, which we'll alt tab to, and pray that this live demo works, um, this isn't yet at the stage where your mum or grandma or granddad could use it. But the idea is that as you um, specify what you want to happen, you can say, for example, I want this to turn on when something happens, rah, rah, rah. What's happening is Etienne does this is that the source code at the bottom is actually being generated dynamically on the fly. Um, this should probably be behind a concealing tab so it doesn't intimidate simple users. Um, but you can see what's going on. And anyone who's got that kind of intuitive bone can say, ah, that's how stuff works, and write their own code to do all the interesting things. And you can just type it directly into the box, hit save. If it doesn't compile, it says no. Uh, it would be nice to actually have that say, there's a compiler error here, or do it as you type. Um, but it ended up being quite an elegant solution to the problem of making easy, th easy things easy and still allowing us to do interesting um, scenarios. That way. Thank you. Um, so here are some more gratuitous pictures of PCBs and stuff, because some people like that. Um, yeah, so what we ended up doing was we, we managed to build this meter with mostly open source tools. Uh, if you're ever going to consider using the power management chip that we did, um, I'd highly recommend against doing it. Uh, don't go there. It's too bad. The manufacturer does not want to help you um, unless you cough up thousands and thousands of dollars, but that was unlikely. But yeah, so the take-home lesson was just to look at uh, both the hardware and the software that yeah, you have to get involved in designing something to work. Uh, we hit a couple of hurdles along the way. Um, there was the MMU issue. The fact stuff was closed source. Um, and I mentioned that we had electrical noise issues. We're not sure that we had electrical noise issues because we couldn't track them down, but we have weird behavior. And by anything else, noise is the easiest thing to blame because who knows what's going on. Um, we also had issues um, with the open source SDCC compiler. You're not the first. Yay! <laughs> so it turned out that once our source code got to about 27k, um, it would stop booting. It turned out that it was producing incorrect assembly, and we think, oh well, it's open source, we can fix this. So we download the compiler source code. I think I'm a reasonably bright guy, I'm not brilliant, but I figure I can spend three days looking at a compiler and saying, oh, that's the bug. No. Even open source doesn't help you there. Um, and we couldn't actually get it down to a sizable test case to reproduce it. There was, it came and went. Um, and it was very hard to actually narrow down what it was. Um, but if you turn off optimizations on the compiler, it seemed to work. So that's work in progress. Um, so yeah, we're looking at making a new version to overcome these problems and still stick with open source tools, but more open devices. So ditch that tree and ship. There was nothing else on the market at the time to do power management. There might be now. We haven't looked hard yet. Um, and that is more or less the E4 meter. Would anyone like to ask any questions, or would you rather go to lunch? <laughs> That's a standard animation. I didn't do that. <laughs> um, in your picture with the current, oh, up here. Right, sorry. In your picture, in your photo with the current sensor, you had it going through only the active line. Yes. Our PCB isn't actually like this picture, by the way. Yeah, we that didn't one. Build this. Yeah, you've only got it, yep. got it going through the active line. Yep. Is that necessary? Like, because that means you have to split up the power cable, or can you just put it around the whole thing, or is it then a problem because you've got the neutral in there as well? No, yeah, the laws of physics say it's the difference between the two, and if you put both in, you get zip. So. This is actually on the PCB, though. So it's just not something that you have to take outside the box to attach. But it is an issue if you want to um, just have a little hand device. You actually need something that spits out the active cable. So. You can get clamp meters that do fit around. You can get clamp meters that do fit around, and that's what 
um, those devices that I showed you that you can buy come with. Um, they're just a sort of iron core that goes around. I'm not 100% sure how they work, but you can see clamp meters that you can clamp over a device and it can measure the current through. Yeah. The laws of physics say that any current transformer must go over the active wire. Um, I'm noticed you're using the Toridian chip there for power measuring. Is there any particular reason you used that chip over something like an Atmel which has ADC inputs and you could then just run any code you wanted on it? We thought it would be easier. <laughs> yeah, the, 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 Toridian, the Toridian chip seems like a, a magical black box that does power measurement for you. It's got eight inputs into the ADC which are automatically multiplexed over the single ADC, so it seems to just sort of do everything for you. <laughs> and in the efforts of keeping our development time low, it seemed like the logical <laughs> choice. <laughs> um, there are chips that you can get from uh, my, uh, analog devices is one big vendor of chips that do smart energy measurement and they compute reactive power and active power and all that kind of stuff. They don't have an inbuilt micro microprocessor core, but they're designed to be interfaced to something like an AVR over, over something like SPI. But I think they're a bit more open and a bit more documented. They they just have ADCs in them plus the smarts that are necessary to compute all the um, reactive phaser type stuff. They might be worth looking. At. I think the, the other attractive thing of the other attractive feature of this was that it was cheap. Big mistake. We we did actually um, do the research on all the different devices you could get. Um, this one seemed like it seemed like the, um, the really the best solution to in order to do this in a short amount of time. Um, we are making different choices with the next version. Well, we've got an intern coming to help us with it in February, so we'll definitely be looking at developing it this year. And you may see it on the market. I don't know. This isn't what we're, we're both students at yeah, UNSW, this is, this is not what we're supposed to be doing, by the way. <laughs> definitely not a full-time project for us. Is there a question? Um, the other day there was a talk on a similar product that was uh, built using Arduino, and um, other commercial entities seem to be getting in on the, the market as well. Um, have you seen any kind of efforts to standardise the communications between the meter and the the, the website or the, the back ends that people are using? Um, yeah, I saw that talk as well. The devices that you can buy that I showed before say that you can get per appliance meters that sort of, they're plugged through devices that you can buy on eBay um, and they will communicate wirelessly back to a central point. Um, but I haven't seen them on the market, I haven't seen them available to buy yet. Um, it's, the opportunities are endless with this sort of stuff. You can go as nuts as you want with the design. We tried to keep it simple, but even we put stuff in there that was too complex to finish in the time required. Uh, are you interested in tying things together with Zigbee? It also seems to be a bit of a trend in the market. Yeah, it's, a, it's one of the multitude wireless communication devices out there, right? Um, it, I like the idea of using the existing AC wiring to do the data transmission. That seems like um, the most un unintrusive way to do it. Um, yeah. So um, back to the previous question of uh, sort of API, so tying these things together. Well, uh, Google have actually got a power API that they, but that they have made available and uh, nominally open, very like their um, Google Web Toolkit. The only problem is if you build something yourself, you can't actually get an API key. You have to go and apply to Google to get a special API key, and you can only really do that if you've actually got a commercial product. So. Again, it's one of these things that seems really awesome, but um, the follow through for something, if you build it yourself, is a, is a bit hard. Yeah, um, it seems kind of interlocked with the power distribution companies, right? You can only use power meter if you're on this distributor in the US or the UK. I don't understand why the data is so sensitive that you can't just access it yourself. I think I have a Googler who wants to respond. Is that right? <laughs> Maybe I can help you later, but that wasn't <laughs> the point of that okay. question. Um, I, I've brought in uh, Canada a device called the ECM 1240, which is similar to that. It has seven channels, uh, cost about 200 bucks, which is pretty cheap for seven plus voltage. 
and using an AC to AC converter. Um, I'll just, I have a few pictures in my talk this afternoon. But the point is, when, um, I mean, when it's so cheap now, you can just get something integrated with serial ports, Ethernet, or Zigbee. Uh, does it make sense to just grab something like that, or that was just for fun, just to see what you could do? Because basically, it, it does exist. So what, one of the issues that we were looking at quite closely was just accuracy. And it turned out switch mode power supplies in particular are horrible to measure. They, they do not have a power factor of one, so um, the power that you might measure is completely wildly wrong. I, I heard a rumor once that if you had a very specific waveform drawing current out of your power meter, you could save about 90% of your power bill, because the uh, electricity providers weren't measuring it correctly. So if you were sneaky, you could actually get a lot more power out. I think you're talking about the power factor. And yeah. the cheap so, devices so. that only have the ferrite don't measure the power factor. Yeah. But if you measure the voltage and the Stein curve, then you can see what the offset is to get the power factor. Yeah. And indeed, if you're a low power factor like 50, you only pay half of what you're really using. So this, this also assumes that they're actually perfect sine waves, which that is not always true. Correct, um, yes. Uh, yeah. So yeah. the so devices are supposed to measure that for you. But you're right. How you measure okay. it is kind of... Yeah. It depends, yeah. yeah this, this was one of the few chips we found that actually sampled regularly and did the correct integration to measure true power. Oh, okay. So maybe it does a better job. Fair enough. Thanks. You've actually already half, an half answered my question, but I was wondering about um, <coughs> the accuracy of your stuff that you've written compared to the ones you buy on eBay, for example. Did you do any sanity checking on those? Like, are they totally random? Or? Uh, we compared it against our $700 off-the-shelf uh, off power meter. Um, for purely resistive loads, it's dead on. Um, for less pure loads, um, the accuracy of our meter is actually a bit lacking, uh, primarily because that black box that I mentioned, um, it, it gives you the reactive power, the real power, and the apparent power, which should form three sides of a, of a right angle triangle. It doesn't. <laughs> it should give you three numbers which are the same, and it doesn't. If you're looking at those small plug-through devices that you buy off eBay, I have actually tested one of those as well. They're, they're accurate at high currents, but at low currents they seem to be less accurate. And that's the problem with the sense resistor that I talked about before, right? You need to really think about what sort of devices you want to measure and how much accuracy you want at certain ranges. Um, and that's where auto-ranging comes in with your multimeter, right? Um, you even have two separate inputs for different current ranges on most multimeters because of the fusing. <laughs> Hi, so a um, couple of bits of information because the gentleman over there was talking about the Google Power Meter stuff. So there's another API called Patchabay, if you've heard of Patchabay, which you can use as an individual, which gives you kind of in the cloud data analysis of, of, of different power things. Um, the individual appli uh, um, appliance monitors are the things that you connect to the current cost NV. Mm, yeah. That's got 10 different channels. Yeah. Um, and those are the little wireless transmitters that you can then connect to different... I've got a development board for, for that, but I don't have the actual um, device. Um, the other the, the question I, I had to ask was, have you guys looked at the AME website, AEMEE, which is about um, measuring individual um, power signatures effectively for different devices? And they have an API for that as well. I haven't heard of that one, sorry. AME. Okay. AME, A M double e dot com. Check. Right. You, sh you should probably have, have a look at that. No. So I, I did mention in the, and I think you were there in the Arduino mini, mini conf on Monday afternoon that, that we've got this home camp community out of the UK where we, we look at a lot of these kind of similar things that you've been discussing. So maybe worth kind of uh, connecting, connecting up at some stage. Right. Time for one more question. Um, I think with the... Uh, the, one of the reasons that a lot of power companies are switching over from the old dial style meters to the new digital meters is because the digital meters do actually take into account power factor um, so that you know you can't do the dodgy thing of like trying to. I think to the old ones do too. Um, it was probably a problem back in the 50s or whatever. Mm, yeah, um, I, think, definitely I don't think you've been able to do now. that one for a long time. Yeah. Is that all we have time for? Thank you for listening. Thanks, guys. I'd just like to... Um